Okay, folks, let, um, let's make a start. Just one notice to say before we uh, begin our service, and that is to say that this uh, Wednesday at 12 o'clock is the Seniors Lunch Club. So, Tam, you making buns? Yeah, I'll bring two in. Yeah. There we go. Got some buns, some Ouija buns, and uh, <laughs> buns. Like fruit loaf. All right, all right. Yeah. Well, I'll do mushroom soup and leaky potato. Wow. Oh, boy. There we go. So that sounds appetising, but you do have to be over 60 to come to that. Um, so, again, just get that in your diary. Just if there's anyone you know um, in that age bracket, 60 plus, uh, whether it's relatives, whether it's friends, whether it's neighbours, please do invite them along to Seniors Lunch. It's been really good the past few months. We've got a lot of people coming along, and uh, it's a great time to get together, to have some fun, to eat together. I think we're going to do a quiz again and uh, also a great opportunity to share the gospel with uh, some of the older folks in the scheme here. Um, so that's this Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Um, let me begin by reading to us some words from Psalm 66 and then we're going to sing to God be the glory. So if the musos want to come up, um, and I will read these words to lead us into a time of, uh, into our time of worship together. Psalm 66 says this, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. Well, let's stand together and sing these praises and remind ourselves what awesome deeds God has done for us. Let's stand and sing to God be the glory.
Okay, um, we're going to pray as we begin our service. We're going to pray as we do for a different nation, different church that we are connected to. Um, this week we're going to pray for uh, the nation of Ghana. Uh, 34 million people, about 63% of that population in Ghana would say that they are Christian. Um, so a huge Christian influence there. But probably only about 10% would attend church regularly. Um, so we're going to pray for the church in that nation. We're going to give thanks for the peace and unity that is there and for the growth that is happening, but pray that that would uh, continue to develop, and um, particularly work that is done in Ghana amongst young people. Um, there's a number of organizations doing a great work amongst the young people in Ghana, and one of the big problems, particularly in uh, the city of Accra, is the number of street kids that are there. So around about 30,000 street children just in Accra alone, which is a huge number. And that's right, yeah. And so we're going to pray for a number of ministries involved in helping kids living on the streets in Accra and um, who have been abandoned or orphaned. And we'll pray for that. We're also going to pray for, you may have seen on the news, there's a, a train accident in India in which 261 people were killed. And we will pray uh, for that. Closer to home, we are going to pray as well for Markinch Free Church. Um, which is a housing scheme in Inverness, and we'll pray for uh, them there. Um, so let's begin our service by praying. Father God, we want to shout for joy to you. We want the whole earth to sing the glory of your name. How awesome are your deeds! How great is your power! Father, we pray that the nations would bow down to you and sing praises to your name. Father, as we reflect on who you are, as we come now to worship you, we are reminded of your awesome deeds that have been shown to us. Father, the most awesome deed, that you came down to us as one of us, that you came in the person of Jesus, that you humbled yourself, and came not to be served, but to serve those who had rebelled against you. Father, as we think on Jesus, as we think on the fact that he hung on that cross for our sin, for our failures, we are reminded of your awesome deeds, of your great love, of your eternal kindness. For Father, we want to admit that we are sinful people, and as we gather as your church, we do not gather as people who have it all sorted, people who um, are good and perfect. We gather as those who are sinful and who are in need of a Savior. Father, we gather as people that have messed up so many different areas of our life. And we want to confess to you that we are sinners. We want to confess to you that we have offended you with our sin. We deserve nothing from you. And yet, Father, we sing for joy because even though that's the truth, you have given us everything in Jesus. For you are gracious and kind. And your awesome deeds are seen in the fact that your son Jesus hung on that cross for all our sin, past, present, and future, and now it has been wiped clean, and we are adopted into your family, and every day we have reason to sing for joy because of the great thing that you have done for us in saving us from our sin. Father, may the nations know that wonderful, life-saving, eternal gospel particularly this morning, we want to pray for the nation of Ghana. Father, we pray that the church would continue to grow there. So we see that there are many people who would call themselves Christians, but not many who would attend your church regularly. Father, would you waken them up to the necessity of sticking with Jesus, of serving one another, of loving one another. Father, we pray for um, a clear break from all the bondage to the charms and the occult practices that were going on in that nation. 
We pray for true liberty in Jesus. Father, we want to pray especially for the work that is being done amongst young people in that nation. Thank you for IFES, for Navigators, for Crew, for these organizations, for CEF, all these organizations that do work with young people, with students in universities and in colleges. Father, we want to pray for the conversion and discipleship of a new generation of Christians who will make an impact in the religious and cultural and political and economic life of Ghana. Father, would your spirit move among them? Particularly this morning, we want to pray for the work that is being done amongst the many street children in Accra. Father, thank you for the ministries that are there. We pray that they would receive the resources that they need to work with these needy children. And Father, we pray that above all, this would be an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Father, would there be love and compassion shown, practical care, but above all, would that life-saving gospel go out to these tens of thousands of kids so that they can know that there is an eternal home in Jesus. Father, we want to pray for the incident that happened in India this past week. We see the images on the news of the 260-odd uh, people who were killed in that train crash in India, the thousands that have been injured. Father, it's such a great tragedy. It's a reminder to us just of how frail life is and how broken our world is. Father, please would you comfort the families of those who have been killed or injured in that accident. Father, we pray that, that through this, again, this would be an opportunity for the, the good news of the gospel to bring hope into what seems like a hopeless situation. Father, please would you work through that, we pray. And Father, closer to home, we want to pray for our friends up in Mark Inch, Free Church up in Inverness. Thank you for Chris and Catherine and the work that they have done there. Thank you for Richard and Donna Brown and Joe and Mary and all those involved in ministering in that scheme. Father, they've gone through many difficulties and rough times, but it's amazing to see how your church has grown. And so we praise you, Father, for the great growth that's happened there. We praise you for the new people that have come to faith through that church. And Father, we ask that you would help and encourage them, as many of them find it hard to uh, live as a Christian, particularly in that area. Father, we know the challenges that come with that. So please, would you continue to provide for their needs, encourage these Christians this morning as they meet to worship you. Father, would they feel built up in the truth of your word? And would your gospel go out to that scheme? And would Jesus be glorified, we pray. And Father, we want to pray for us now as we come to study your word. We ask, Almighty God, would you speak to us? Would we be conscious of your voice speaking to us? Would you expose the folly that is in our hearts and would you show us the path of wisdom? Please, would we see Jesus this morning? It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, folks, if you have a Bible, please open it up to Proverbs chapter 6. Oh, there we go. 639 in the Pebble Beach one and 47 five in the mountain one, which is the same as the little one. 69, Proverbs chapter 6. Um, it's going to be a bit of a short one this week. We're going to be reading verse 1 to 19. Proverbs chapter 6. So the, the storyline of the Bible is all about God's rescue plan to save us from our sins. And that's what he does ultimately through uh, Jesus. But as we've studied Proverbs, we've been saying that forgiveness is not the end goal of what God has come to do for us. Forgiveness is just the beginning. It's the means to an end. Because not only does God want to forgive us of all our sin, he wants to transform us. He wants to change us. And one of the main ways that he does that is by getting us to be wise, to walk a path of wisdom. And so the book of Proverbs in the Bible is written to teach us how to be wise. Now, we've defined wisdom as the skill of navigating life well. And so at the beginning of Proverbs, chapters 1 through 9, what we have are a series of speeches 
that are a father speaking to his teenage boy, trying to encourage his boy to get wisdom. At any cost, whatever you do, whatever's awaiting you, and the days that God has given to you in your life, the one thing you must get, son, is wisdom. That will help you make the most of life and not muck it up. And so far, we've learned some big key truths about wisdom. What does that look like? We've learned that it, it begins with the fear of the Lord, which is, a, and we said that's not being afraid that God's going to hurt you. It's, it means seeing God as big and ourselves as small. We've learned the importance of the company we keep. If we're to be wise, we've got to be really careful who we hang about with a lot of the time. Uh, we've learned about the importance of listening to God. We've learned that wisdom comes when we trust God with our whole heart and don't try and do life by ourselves. And we learned last week how we keep on wisdom's path by guarding our heart, our inner being. We've got to protect that if we are to keep going in wisdom. Now today, the father is going to sit down with his boy and he's going to commend wisdom again but this time he's going to do it by warning his son of the potential foolish situations that he could get into just in everyday life. If we are to stay on the right track and not make a mess, there's three situations, or we could say three types of people, we need to make sure that we don't become. Well, what are they? Well, let's read Proverbs chapter 6. Father speaking to his son says this, My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you said and snared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, to free yourself since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. A troublemaker and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eye, signals with his feet, and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in his heart, he always stirs up conflict. Therefore, disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Amen. This is God's word. Hopefully it'll make sense as we go through the speech that the father has given to his uh, son. Before we do, we're going to sing uh, some words from Psalm 25. Um, the tune that we're going to sing this to is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And just listen to these words. They're really like all the Psalms. They're, they're a prayer. And it's a prayer asking God to forgive us, forgive us from the sins of our youth, forgive us for the sins that we still do. And a prayer asking us to walk the right path with him, which is exactly what the father wants to commend his son to do in Proverbs. So let's stand together, if you're able, and we'll sing Psalm 25, verse 4 to 11.
Good. Please do have a, a seat. It's great, um, great words to sing. It's amazing to think, you know, these words are like 3,000 years old that we've just sung. Obviously not written in English, but in Hebrew. And yet how relevant they are to us today and us as we come to study Proverbs. I'm just going to pray again and then we're going to look at this passage. It's a bit of a tricky one. They've pretty much, I mean, they've been moved around to make it rhyme and to fit into a kind of English way of, of speaking. But if you read the, the psalm itself in the Bible, it's a pretty good translation. So um, let me pray and then we'll look at this. Father, just want to ask very simply, speak to us now by your Holy Spirit. Give us insight. Give us understanding. Show us the right path to walk. And Father, would you... Um, would you speak to our hearts? Help us listen to what you say to us. May we be wise. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. Okay, um, as we've studied Proverbs, we've seen that one of the dominant images uh, to describe, well, let me ask you, what's the main image that the Father uses in Proverbs to describe what life is like? Yeah? Path. Yeah, it's a journey which is yeah, what you were saying, I think. Um, life is a journey, and it's a journey that has two paths that you can walk on. One is the path of wisdom that leads to forgiveness, that leads to life, that leads to an eternity with God, and the other is a path of folly that will lead to ruin, that will lead to death, and that will lead to an eternity without God. You will be on one of those two paths. There's no third way. It's as simple and as clear as that. And if you want to be on the path that leads to life, that leads to eternity with God, well, it begins with what your relationship with God is like. You see, the reality is that we're all born sinners and we're all on a path that is journeying away from God. We don't give any thought to Him. And so, by default, we're on a path that's foolish. But Jesus came to die for our foolish sin and to bring us back to God. So if you want to be on wisdom's path, the beginning of that is not about what you can do, but trusting what Jesus has done for your sin. He sorts out all that is wrong with us. And when we follow him, when we give our life to him, our life goes in a new direction. So the words used to describe that throughout the Bible is this word repent. And repent means to turn away from your sin and turn towards God. When you do that, you are on the path of wisdom, the path that leads to life. But here's the thing. Trust in Jesus now. You're saved from all your sin. But here's the reality. We are not home. We're still journeying until we get home. We still need to navigate life through this broken world and that is not easy that is why the thing we need most to do to navigate through this broken world is wisdom wisdom not only puts us on the right path it keeps us on the right path so um keeping with this journey idea let's imagine that say we're going to have a church day out and we're going to hike up a huge mountain which sounds like an awful day. But let's imagine we do that, right? And it's a dangerous hike. So we need to get briefed before we do it. Someone's coming to brief us and they tell us, look, here's the equipment you need. You need to take these kind of shoes. Make sure you've got enough water with you. Here's the kind of jacket you should have. Always make sure you carry rope. We've got a checklist of stuff that we need to have in place before we make the journey. He is equipping us for that journey. Now, that is what the father has been doing with his son so far in Proverbs. The journey is life. He's walked that journey and he's telling his son the wisdom he needs to have in place in order to make the most of life. This is what God has been telling us about how we keep going. But if we were to get this briefing on how to climb this mountain, not only will we be told what we need, we'd also be told, here's what you have to avoid. 
Here's where you need to, to stay away from. So the person might say to us, look, there's a side of the mountain that you should not go near because there's a, a steep scree slope on it. And if you go on that, you could end up sliding down to your death. Or there's a path that goes up this way, but watch out because there's a ravine on the other side with a hundred foot drop. Or they might say to us, look, make sure before you go up, you've checked what the weather forecast is so that you don't land yourself in any danger. Telling us, look, here's what you've got to avoid as you go on that journey. Here's the pitfalls that could seriously harm you. Well, this is what the father is saying to his son now in chapter 6 of Proverbs. He's saying, look, I've told you what you need for the journey of life, but let me just tell you as well, here's what you've got to stay away from. Here, here is what you need to make sure you are to avoid if you are to make the most of life, the, the pitfalls that could lead you off the path of wisdom. And these three pitfalls that he speaks of here, they're embodied by three kinds of people. Here's who they are. They all begin with S, so you should remember them, and we're going to look through them. Firstly, there's the short-sighted person who's careless with money. Secondly, there's the sluggard. It's a good term, isn't it? It's a term used a lot in Proverbs. Sluggard does no work. And then thirdly, there's the scoundrel who cheats and who lies. Three types of people. My son, do not be like them. Now, there's a fourth one that we're going to look at next week, and this is the big one, so that's why we're saving a whole week for it. A fourth S, we could call her the seductress. And we'll look at her next week. But these three are also threats to the son as he journeys in life, as he walks this path of wisdom. Now, here's what's interesting about these three people. It's so easy to be like them. So they're not extreme bad people. This is just everyday people. These three people won't be in the jail for what they do. Third one, maybe, but they won't be in the jail. They're not doing anything illegal. They're just three fools. Now, uh, they're not the same. I think that's important to say. They do go in order of seriousness. So the folly of the short-sighted person is not as serious as the folly of the scoundrel. The short-sighted sighted person is called a son, which means he has that relationship with God. But it, interestingly, the sluggard and the scoundrel are not called sons, which means they are far from God. In fact, the scoundrel, we're told that his actions, God hates his actions. So there are degrees of folly. It's just like if we were journeying up the mountain, there's some dangers that are more serious than others. But we need warned of all three because often it's when you make the small, silly, short-sighted mistake that you can go on a slippery slope in which it becomes worse, in which you might become lazy, or which you can even start to become the person described at the end of this chapter who is on a path that God hates. Folks, these three people might seem mundane. This is serious because you could wreck your life if you're like them. We're going to look today at how we don't muck up the time that we have on this earth, how we make the most of it. And how we do that is by avoiding these three pitfalls. So we're going to look at them, but here's what we must always remember. See, if you follow Jesus, he forgives all your sin, he forgives all your folly, and it's his love and his grace that motivates us to strive not to be like him. This is God our Father speaking to us, his children, telling us, do not be like these three people. So, here's the first person we want to avoid being like, the short-sighted person who's careless with money. Have a look at verse 1. You probably found this very confusing. I did when I first read it. Father speaking to his son says, my son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you said and snared by the words of your mouth. So, he, here's what he's talking about. It just seems so mundane in so, so many ways. It's so important. In the ancient world, 
if somebody wanted to get a loan of money, often they had to have another person with them who would agree to be their security. Well, exactly. One step ahead. Got that in my notes. So, exactly right. Like a guarantor. That's what it was. So, the security was responsible, the person who was the security was responsible for paying off the loan if the individual who took out the loan couldn't do it. So, like, I remember when I, got, when I first started renting a flat, I had to put down my dad, my old man, as a guarantor. And so it meant that if I didn't pay the rent, he had to fork out the money and pay the rent. So we kind of have similar things like that today. Very common practice, it seems, at the time that uh, Proverbs was written. Yeah? We did the very same thing when we first got married. The first thing we found to buy a washing machine. Yeah. We had to use my mother-in-law's name to get guarantor. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so so we do do that today. Um, have a we have a guarantor, um, someone that would cover the debt if we can't pay it. Now the father sitting down with his boy, and he's saying, "Make sure that's not you. Do not be a guarantor. Do not be a security for." someone. Now, I don't think he's saying don't ever do that. It's not like my, my dad was foolish when he was being my guarantor. Um, but he's saying to him, if you look at the words of verse 1, don't do it for a stranger. Don't do that for someone you don't know. Now, why would the son do this? Um, maybe it could be that he's doing it because he's wanting to make some money himself. So if you were like a guarantor, if you were security, you would get a cut of some money and it would be a way of making a quick buck without having to do anything. So some people would do it for that reason. It could also be that the son's just wanting to be kind and he's wanting to help someone who needs to get a loan. And he says, look, you know, I'll be your security. I'll help you, buddy. But I think regardless of what the motive is, the problem here is that the son has been short-sighted. The son isn't thinking about the long-term consequences of signing up to be this random stranger's security. He's signing up to a contract that, as verse 2 says, will trap and ensnare him. Now, here's the thing. See, when you come to follow Jesus, every part of your life gets changed. And one key area that will change dramatically is how we approach money. So one of the things Jesus teaches on more than anything, I think, is money. And he says to us, look, you cannot serve both God and money. When you come to serve God, you have a different approach to money. The Christian is to be radically and sacrificially generous with their finances. And we do that because God was radically and sacrificially generous to us through Jesus. We deserve nothing but he gave us everything. And so the more we get God's grace, the more we should be generous. In fact, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about how important it is to give your money generously, especially to those who are poor. If we're not giving any money, the gospel hasn't sunk in deep enough. But the Bible is also clear on this, that as well as being generous, we have to be wise. So here's something. Did you know you can be a generous and kind person but still be a fool with your money? Son could be saying, look, I'm just trying to help this guy out. I'll be his security. He's not being sinful. His heart is in the right place. But he's not being wise. Some types of folly are sinful and wicked other types of folly can be done with good intention. And I think that's a really helpful for us in understanding what wisdom is. You can be generous, but still a fool. You can do things with all the right motivations, but still be a fool. Be generous, but think about the long-term consequences. Don't just spend thoughtlessly. So let me give you an example. I know uh, many people uh, around here who will be really generous with their kids around Christmas time. Buy them loads of presents, and uh, they love their kids. They want to give the best to them. But here's the truth. They don't have the money to do that. Intentions are, are good. It's out of love. They want to give the best for the kids. 
but they don't have the money to do that. So what do they do to try and get the presents for their kids? Well, let's get some credit cards out. And they sign up in that contract to a credit card. And they rack up the debt. And every month, the uh, interest on that debt increases. It's something like, is Wonga.com still a thing? Remember that? They would give you, offer you these loans, and, but they would tiny little small print, which would be like 3,000%. Yeah, well, exactly. It will be like 3,000% interest or something. Um, and people take that money. They want to use that money. want to use it for good intentions in some cases, but they've not thought about the long-term consequences. And look, see if you've ever been in that situation. The word that the Father uses here is exactly how you feel, trapped, ensnared, like a bird caught in a trap, like a gazelle caught in a trap. I remember one guy being in such despair over his debt that it was causing him to contemplate suicide because he was trapped and couldn't get out. And he did it out of good intentions, but it wasn't wise. And at the end of the day, what do your kids need more presence at Christmas or your presence at Christmas. And so the father says to his son, look, be careful. Don't walk into these traps. Don't take out loans that you can't pay back. Don't get credit cards that you can't afford. Don't give money to people that might actually cause them more harm than good. So if someone's struggling with an addiction, and you just give them money, you might facilitate that addiction and do more damage to them than help them. It comes from a good place, but it's just not very wise. Don't spend without thinking about the future. It might not be sinful, but it is foolish. And there are times, to be honest, where it is sinful. See, the sin of greed is a bit subtle. This is a clear warning here, I think, against gambling. The lottery, the scratch cards. People might say they have good motives, but really it's the love of money that undergirds that. It's not wise because you always end up losing. That's the cliche, isn't it? The dealer always wins. If you've already got into trouble through making some short-sighted decisions, particularly financially, here's what the father would say. Here's what he says to his son. It sounds like the son's already done this. So the father says, get out. You've got to get out of this. The son is to persistently go to his neighbor. That's what the verses that follow are saying. Make sure his neighbor pays off the loan so that he can stop being a security. Keep hassling him and telling him to do it. Do it now. Verse 4, allow no sleep to your eyes or slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself. Look, if that's you, it's not always easy to free yourself. But let me encourage you, speak to us. We can work in it together. We have great organizations, something like Christians Against Poverty, that can help in financial struggles that we get into. And if you do get free, here's the warning. You must not go back and repeat that folly. It can wreck everything. So be generous with your money. So important. Be generous but also be wise. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because if I'm foolish and generous, I'm going to lose all my money and I can't be generous for very long. Whereas if I'm wise and generous, I can be generous all the days of my life. I have a better impact. Some of us, for some, of, some things for us to think about in regards to this pitfall, just examining our hearts, how we might fall into this. Let's think, where are we being careless with our money? Don't go to what you think about others. Let's think about ourselves. Do we budget our money, our finances? How regular is our giving? Have we sought to give in a way that is, here's a good term, both sacrificial yet sustainable? Both those together, sacrificial yet sustainable. Are we wise? And let's let the grace of Jesus motivate everything we do. We don't do this to get God to accept us. We do this because God already has accepted us. He forgives all our folly and praise God that our future is in his hands and not based on some of the short-sighted decisions that we make in life. 
Let that drive us to be both wise and generous. It's the first pitfall. Really interesting. Just seems like a kind of slightly mundane thing. But I've seen people go into this pitfall and it's wrecked their lives. Let's be careful. Second pitfall. This is more serious. We don't want to be like the sluggard who does no work. Uh, in verse 6, uh, I don't think the father, <laughs> he's speaking to his son. I don't think he just starts laying in his son and calling him a sluggard. He's spoken to his son in verse 1 to 5, and now he turns to address someone called the sluggard, which is not the son, but he's telling the son this to make sure the son doesn't become him. And he just lays into this guy called the sluggard. Now, in a few weeks' time in Proverbs, we're going to spend a bit of time looking at this as we think about work and wisdom. Um, but So we're not going to spend too much time on that. But I just want us to look at these verses here. The father lays into the sluggard by going all David Attenborough on him. Look at verse 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food in harvest. Um, I, don't know if, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Blair Drummond's Safari Park. Um, it's great, isn't it? I, I think it's the best zoo uh, in Scotland. We went to Blair Drummond's Safari Park I think last summer with the kids, uh, and it was so good. But in the, if you've ever been in there, in the elephant enclosure, they have this little plastic tube running along the bottom of the window. And when you looked into it, you could see hundreds of these little ants walking along a rope the length of the tube. And they were going from this glass case that was on one side of the enclosure that had this huge plant in it. They were going there, cutting off little bits of the leaves, walking along the rope into another glass case on the other side of the enclosure that had their nest in it, their anthill, hive, whatever it's called. And they were just constantly moving, going over, cutting a bit of leaf, walking along the rope, and then dropping it off uh, the nest. To be honest, it was a uh, it was more entertaining than the elephant. But they weren't doing that because they had to. Right? It wasn't like nobody was in the enclosure and then as soon as we walked into the room, the ants saw us and they thought, oh, flip boys, let's get back to work. We better pretend that we're busy. There's, there's people here watching us. They were just doing it constantly because that's what they do. God has given them this wisdom to do what they were made to do. But in contrast to the tiny little wise ant, here we have the big foolish sluggard. The ant works even though they have no overseer or ruler, but the sluggard does nothing. Bone idle. Bone idle. And he does have an overseer. He does have a ruler. He does have a law that he is to follow. God's law. God's his overseer and ruler. You see, the lazy person goes against the grain of God's wisdom that is embedded all throughout the creation of this world. We are not made to do nothing. But this sluggard, what does he want to do? All he wants to do is sleep. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Just a little longer in the bed. We've been there. You turn over, snooze the alarm, goes off again. You snooze it again. The slugger just keeps hitting the snooze button. Doesn't want to get out of bed. See, for the lazy person, sleep is like a, a drug. You know, drugs are a means of escaping this world, so is sleep. It could be a means of just wanting to escape from the reality of having to work. Now look, we're not talking about people who are bedridden for health reasons um, uh, or various different other reasons. We're talking about people who just don't want to work. And that's our culture. In fact, every one of these three we see in the scheme, we see in the city, we see in our culture. Carelessness with money and a desire not to work. We see it especially with young people. Um, so I was, uh, we were all teenagers at one point. I think when you're a teenager, 
11 a.m. is an early start for the day, isn't it? So it's a special warning to young people. Get instilled now a good work ethic, and that will set you up for life. See, at the time the father spoke these words to his son in the place and the time, there was no state benefit system either. So if you didn't work, here's the reality, you didn't get any money. Poverty would come on you like a thief. Now, I'm not saying benefits are bad or that people on them are lazy. No, that's not always not the case. No, it's not always the case. But we've got to be honest, there are plenty of people who can do a job but they choose not to. Easier to stay at home, play video games, get high, and then just collect the check. But again, the sluggard is given to us not to point the finger, but to look into our own hearts. It's not just about employment, it's about our attitude. See, you can have a job and actually be quite a lazy person. Similarly, you can have no job and be someone who works very hard. So how might we be like the sluggard? So no, let's think, do we arrive late constantly? Do we do jobs half-heartedly? Do we come up with excuses just because we can't be bothered? There's loads of proverbs about the sluggard, and uh, some of them are great. Uh, here's one from Proverbs 26, verse 14. It says this, the sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. In other words, the sluggard loves to come up with excuses, no matter how ridiculous they are. Can't come to work today. Why not? Well, there's a lion, a fierce lion roaming the streets. Watch out. Watch out for the pitfall of laziness. Now, look, when we look at work in, in a few weeks' time, we'll talk about this. Of course, it's important to rest. We want to do that. Downtime is good. The Father is not saying that. He is addressing the person whose whole life is downtime. Be like the ant. Working, doing the job, and getting on with it, not trying to please people. And here's the big way we should also think about this. Not just the work we do for ourselves, but the work that we do for Jesus and his kingdom. See, the truth is we can work at our jobs, but be lazy with Jesus. Can't be bothered reading my Bible. Can't be bothered praying. I can't be bothered telling others about him. If that's us, let's wake up. Be an ant for Jesus. Work hard for him. Here's why the sluggard thing is so important to think about. Faithfulness with Jesus and laziness do not fit together. They're like water and oil. And so we avoid this pitfall. And we look at Jesus, who again motivates us to do that. Jesus never tires of us, even if we might tire with him. He's always there, always loving, always forgiving. And as Ephesians chapter 2 says, he has saved us by his grace so that we could do good work. Work hard at life, work hard for the kingdom, rest well, sleep well, and labor on knowing that the labor you do for Jesus is never in vain. Third pitfall, and now this actually is the most serious of all of them. This person is not a Christian, and God hates what they do. This is the scoundrel who cheats and who lies. Look at verse 12. A troublemaker and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eye and signals with his feet and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in his heart. He always stirs up conflict. Therefore, disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. There are elements of this scoundrel in all of us. I know there is in me, and we're not saying that we must be perfect, but here's the difference. When we are like this, we bring it to God, asking for forgiveness striving not to be like him. But this scoundrel, this troublemaker, this villain doesn't do that. He doesn't care. He's what we, if this was a Dundee translation, the Bible, sleek it. That's how we describe him. Sleek it. Yeah, Abby Burns. Sneak, con artist, 
someone who delights in doing dodgy deals, getting one over on people, who loves stirring up conflict, gossiping, spreading lies. See, a person like that, they might not get the jail. They might get through life and sail through life without any consequences. But they will meet God. And that path leads to destruction. And they will answer to him. And God hates it. Hates it. It's not me saying that. Look at verse 16. There are six things the Lord hates. Seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness who pours out lies. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Haughty eyes means a proud person. So to be haughty is to be proud. So someone who thinks they're great. Or someone who only thinks about themselves. As someone who has haughty eyes. Last week we saw what the anatomy of the disciple was. You notice all the body parts here. This week this is the anatomy of a rebel. Every part of their body is an act of rebellion against God. Eyes that are proud, tongues that lie, hands that are violent, hearts that devise wickedness, feet that rush into evil. They pour out lies, they stir conflict. And God hates it. Here's why God hates this. Do you know why he hates it? He hates it because this is the complete anti-God type of person. This is the exact opposite of what God is like. In fact, as I was studying these verses, I came to realize that this is a perfect description of the one the Bible calls Satan. The one who is also called the father of, the lie, father of lies. And these can seem like such ordinary, small sins. But God hates it. And I don't know about you, but I have lied. It doesn't matter if it's a big lie or a little white lie. I've been proud. Often. I will think only of myself. In my heart, I've devised wickedness. I've thought bad and I've thought ill of other people. In the privacy of my own thoughts. Be involved in gossip. I guess we've all behaved like this in some way because the truth is we are all sinners and it shows us something about ourselves that our human nature often has more in common with the devil than it does with God. But here's the good news. There is one who was never like this. Jesus is God come down to us and he is the opposite of what God hates by being the embodiment of everything God loves. Not a scoundrel, but a son. See, just look at these attributes. Jesus is the great eternal God, greater than all, but his life was not marked by haughty eyes. Rather, his life was marked with humble service. He came not to be served, but to serve those who didn't even like him. Jesus is the truth. Not one bit of him was false or deceptive or insincere. Jesus never shed the blood of the innocent. In fact, he shed his own blood as he died for the guilty, like me. Jesus' heart was perfect and pure, seeking no wickedness. Rather, he only wanted to honor his Father and show grace. Jesus never poured out lies. Rather, he stood silently as the false witnesses and the lies were poured out on him. Jesus didn't stir up hatred. Rather, he died for our sin out of love to create a community that is grounded in love. He was perfect in every way, and that is why he is the only one who could have been the sacrifice for our sin. The only one that could die in our place for our wrong. And that's exactly what he did on that cross. And so all that sin that God hates, and make no mistake, he hates it. When we lie, he's not passive to that. All that sin that God hates in us, all of that's been dealt with by Jesus. So that he does not hate us, but loves us perfectly because of what Christ has done. And folks, that's why we don't want to indulge the sins of the scoundrel. Yes, we are forgiven of them, but that forgiveness changes us. We are not this man. 
So let's strive not to be like him. So think about where we see the pitfalls of pride, the pitfalls of lying to others, the pitfalls of devious thoughts, the pitfalls of gossip that can wreck communities like churches. Our culture says, oh, they're only small things. No, this is Satan's territory. Let's repent and pursue humility, truth, and love because we belong to Jesus. In fact, let's strive to be more like Christ. And I guess that's a good way to close this. We've got these three negative examples we are to avoid, but in the Bible we also have this one positive example who leads the way. Jesus, our King. Look to him. Let's examine ourselves. Let's fight not to be careless with our money, not to be lazy with our work, and not to be proud and arrogant with others. Let's do it with every fiber of our being, but doing it, fixing our eyes on our Savior. He's gone up the mountain, as it were. He's led the way. He walks with us. He will get us home, picking us up every time we fail and stumble. As the apostle says, in Jesus are hidden all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. And so as we look away from these three examples of folly, we look forward to our great example of wisdom. We strive to be like him. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the Father's warnings, pitfalls that we can just so easily slip into in the everyday mundanity of life. These are not extreme situations or extreme people. In many ways, this just seems so normal, and yet it's so dangerous. Deceptive folly can lead us astray and it can wreck our lives. And so we ask, Almighty God, in the days that we have, would we seek not to be like these people, but strive instead to be like King Jesus? Help us to be wise like him. Father, thank you that Jesus has forgiven all our folly. We know that we're guilty here. We've all done this. We've all slipped into these pitfalls multiple times. Thank you that he picks us up, forgives us of all our wrong, and tells us to keep going. Look into him for forgiveness, and look into him as our example to follow. Teach us to be wise, and make the most of this mere breath of life that we have until we are home with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, any questions about that? Yeah, one of these three characters, yeah. Well, I think uh, the reason that they're here is because they're so normal. And it's not like, here's the, the murderer and the, the rapist. Here, here, make sure you're not like them, which we'd all be like, oh, well, yeah, of course. It's actually, here's really three pre pretty normal people. I mean, carelessness with money. Yeah, carelessness with money, like laziness, gossip, cheating. That's our culture. Yeah, and it's so hard not to get into it. Yeah, well, and that's what we struggle with. We, we've all done that. Um, and I think that's why the Father's warning his son. It's not like, here's the obvious things, you know, in terms of breaching the Ten Commandments and like, don't do that. But look, here's the more subtle acts of folly that will sneak under the radar. You won't get to jail for these, but these are the ones that could cause you a lot of damage. Yeah. 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 We all struggle with this. We struggle with being wise with money. We struggle with laziness. Yep. And also being honest in your church family. Yeah. And also when they're in prayer, it's no it's no fault to admit to God in prayer. You struggle with that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, definitely. It's important to admit your struggles to God. To one another, we're appropriate, and, carry, and keep carrying it because then, as you say, you, you crumble. Yeah, you need, we need wisdom, yeah. and wisdom comes not just through the individual but through the collective. As we'll see in Proverbs, we need God's wisdom 
from God's word and with God's people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it can be. These three areas that we've looked at, um, the money, work, and how we treat other people, we're going to come back to them in Proverbs in a lot more detail because the book of Proverbs has a lot to say just practically about how we can navigate these pitfalls. Yeah. Um, sorry. How, how would you treat money generally versus how do you know you put in your heart? Do you know I mean? Well, that's why... Yeah, that's what's... This is why you need wisdom. So wisdom doesn't say, look, here's the X amount to give and what you must do, because that's not the case for everyone. Everyone's in a different situation, different stage in life. And the, the first thing I would say is ask God for wisdom, because James tells us that whenever you ask God for wisdom, he gives it generously. So that's a promise. And then think about it. And part of, part of being wise is budgeting. I think budgeting your giving. So you factor that into your budget. So I need this for food, I need this for my gas and electric, I need this for uh, my rent, whatever it is. But also, here's, I've got this amount I want to try and give for my giving. And it might just be, um, right, I'm really struggling this month, all I can do is a pound. And that's fine, that's great, that's perfect. Well, yeah, so that's it. And it's not, it's not prescriptive like, oh my goodness, you spent 40 quid on a kebab, how dare you? Um, though that probably is quite foolish, unless it was like the best kebab ever. Um, but No, and it's not, it's not to prevent giving. I think what the Father's just saying is just think about the long-term implications of what you're doing. That's it, give, but think about the long-term. Yeah. If, if someone, you should help people who are struggling, but say someone's got a gambling problem and they say, look, I need to lend of a tenor. Giving them that tenor might be just giving them more scratch cards, feeding the addiction. Actually, it could be like, what are you struggling with, mate? Do you want to hang out? Or do you want to go to the shops and get some, I'll get you something to eat? And that, therefore, you're still being generous, but you're thinking more about the long-term implications. So it's just, again, you just need wisdom because it's so, every situation's so different and there's all these nuances. And that's why what's good about Proverbs is it doesn't give something that says, this is the situation and ev this is what you must do in every situation. So there's two Proverbs we'll read later on. One of Proverbs says this, do not answer a fool according to his folly. And in the next verse it says this, answer a fool according to his folly. <laughs> right, well, what does that mean? Well, it's really wise, isn't it? Because there's some times where you've got to answer someone who's been foolish. There's other times where you've got to keep quiet. And wisdom knows when to apply that in each situation. So it's just, when it comes to money, be generous, but just think long term. How can I be sustainably generous and think about the long-term implications don't just i need to do this right now and i think for me personally you know the, the pitfalls for me will be if, if it comes at a good motivation will be like i want to just give this to my kids and actually that might not help them in the long run i want to because sometimes i can't afford to do that and so it might be a case of sorry kids it's oven pizza tonight not dominoes because i've got to watch the budget <laughs> yeah, but and that's just like it's just you know, you, you, but you do you want to you want to give and you want to help and you see you see this could be so I remember one guy for example really struggling with stuff, with money financially and he he really just wanted money, and and he 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 needed it he was in a real bad way. And rather than giving it to him, we thought it would be best to walk with him through how he could get over this <coughs> debt. Um, it's kind of that cliche of if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, but you teach him how to fish, he can eat for, that's a proverb. Um, and it's more helpful to kind of give, help equip him with wisdom to, to use the finance rather than a quick, quick solution. We want a long-term helpful solution. So yes, give money, please do, but be be careful and think. Sorry, yeah. I don't. I, I honestly agree with you. I think that's the one of us. But I don't mind. Don't get me saying you're thinking. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. That's that's the danger with lies, and then they always snowball, and then it becomes a lifestyle. And it's, it can cause severe damage to your life. And so, yeah, I think that's a really important thing to instill. Yeah. So I, I remember one minister who, one minister I was listening to did a talk on Proverbs, talked about a, a, an individual who was involved in a hit and run accident with a child. And he didn't, he just knocked the little one over and then drove away and got arrested, was in jail for it. But he was talking about it, and he said that he felt it began kind of with the fact that he'd always just lied. And it was this kind of mentality of not owning up to your <coughs> difficulties and trying lying to escape it. And it had this drastic effect on him long term. So there's wisdom here. These are small things, but they lead to really serious things. And what it says there, it leads, God hates it, and it leads to destruction. So let's avoid it. Um, let's sing as we close. Um, just a reminder, because we're all fools in many ways. Um, God has changed us, though. And it's just a reminder to us as we finish that for all our sin, Jesus has paid the price for it. And let that grace motivate us to strive to be more like him. So let's sing Jesus paid it all. Stand if you're able, and please remain standing for...
And to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Please do have a seat.